I don't know about you, but I love going into risky, life-changing situations without a clue what I'm doing. Oh, you don't? Well, in that case, allow me to share 10 things I wish I'd known before amputating my leg. 10 things? That's like double the number of toes I have. Did you know that sometimes leg amputees wake up in the middle of the night and go splat? You see, if you have phantom sensation, it feels like your foot is still there. When you're half asleep, you're not questioning whether your groggy mind is playing tricks on you. You're just thinking that you want to use the bathroom then go back to bed. Your foot feels like it's there. So you stand up and splat. My physical therapist says this has happened to every leg amputee he's ever worked with. I was feeling pretty proud of myself that I'd gone two years without going splat. When one day, the kitten got into trouble. Kittens are good at that. Hey, I need you to pretend like you're being naughty. You won't have to try very hard. I went to pick her up, only to realize mid-stride that I didn't have a leg on. Oi, kitten! Oh. How embarrassing. I wish I'd had my back checked out before amputation. There are two main reasons. First, if you have a bad disc, it can put pressure on the nerves that run down to your amputated limb. That makes phantom limb pain even worse than it otherwise would be. Second, after amputation, most amputees use a wheelchair to get around. Sitting that much may make pre-existing back problems worse. You don't want amputation recovery to be more painful than it needs to be. So it wouldn't hurt to identify any back problems ahead of time and make a game plan with your doctors on how to deal with them. Number three, it goes without saying that you should get multiple opinions before scheduling any elective amputation. But sometimes patients are so focused on asking whether they should have an amputation that they don't think to get multiple opinions on who should do it. Little differences in surgical techniques can make a big difference. Quick example, bones have a membrane called a periosteum, sort of like skin covering them. My surgeons peeled back this membrane before shaping my severed bone, then laid the membrane over the beveled edge. Supposedly, this will help prevent bone spurs, but I hear that not all surgeons do it. There are a lot of intriguing little details that make a big difference for the amputee post-surgery. Your amputation will turn out different depending on who does it. The person you really need to get an opinion from is the prosthetist. They have to work with the outcomes produced by many surgeons. So they know better than anyone who in your area does a great job and who's just average. I had a long chat with my prosthetist before amputation, wherein he listed several potential surgeons and their strengths and weaknesses. Try getting the opinions of multiple prosthetists. Speaking of which, Number four, it's super important to check out multiple prosthetics clinics. Picking a prosthetist isn't the same as choosing a doctor or a physical therapist. Doctors get paid per visit or procedure. Prosthetists get paid per leg. So if you pick a prosthetist, then decide you don't like him and try to go somewhere else. It's like asking the new clinic to work for free on your current leg until it's time to get a new one, which could be years. Most businesses that like staying in business aren't going to love that proposition and might not want you as a new patient. You could get stuck with someone you don't like. Hence the importance of meeting multiple prosthetists before choosing one. You want to pick a prosthetist who's highly skilled, has good availability, and that you're comfortable with because fitting a socket is an up close and personal process, especially if you're an above knee amputee. If you live in a smaller town with few or no options, it may be worth driving an hour or two to find someone who's really good. Lefty was a big problem, so I chopped him off. Only it turns out it's easier to cut off a leg than it is to chop off your problems. With elective amputation, what you're really doing is swapping problems. Hopefully you're making a good trade, one that gives you improved function and a better quality of life but amputation isn't a magical solution that will make your problems go away. The domino effect is very real. I've got a video about it, but basically I went into amputation with the naive misconception that once I had a prosthetic leg, I'd be almost normal again. 
Sadly, many amputees are like me and struggle with medical issues after amputation. I wish I'd gone into it with more realistic expectations. Another struggle is insurance. American insurance is fickle. I wish I'd known how inconsistent insurance is at covering amputee expenses. It's not just the periodic battles over whether or not they'll cover a prosthetic leg. I'm still in the middle of one of those fights. I have a friend with the exact same insurance as me. Not just the same provider, but through the same employer, same group number, same doctor, same hospital, same CRPS diagnosis, even the same leg that needed to be amputated in the same year. It's uncanny how similar our profiles were on paper. So you'd think our insurance company would cover the same things for each of us. Wrong. It's been fascinating, in a gruesome sort of way, comparing notes and seeing the differences in what got covered. For example, the hospital staff felt I needed to stay longer at the hospital because of problems I was having, but insurance refused to pay for more than a couple days, despite the medical necessity. So I got abruptly kicked out. Whereas my friend, One-Footed Phoenix, was allowed to stay longer. Insurance approved my request to go to a rehabilitation center, but denied it for my friend. Even our wheelchairs had different things covered. My point is that you should resist the urge to make assumptions about what insurance will provide for the actual amputation and for life afterwards. Basing your expectations on someone else's experiences often leads to disappointment. When insurance is involved, take nothing for granted. I thought my first steps on a prosthetic leg would be euphoric. They weren't. A better word for it would be painful. Who would have thought that walking on a sawed off bone might hurt? When you get your first prosthetic leg, it'll probably be attached to something called a test socket. Even though the socket is made from a mold of your leg and is an exact fit, there are going to be sore points. This test socket is plastic, so it can be heated up and adjusted based on the feedback you give your prosthetist. Before those adjustments are made, those first test steps may not feel so good. Once you build up a callus and get used to it, things feel better, but it takes time, so don't count on things being comfortable at first. TENS units are useful devices that you can use at physical therapy or even at home that can help you rehabilitate after surgery. Turns out they aren't ideal when the limb in question has severed nerves. Something about sending an electrical current through nerves that recently got chopped in half. I learned this the hard way. I really wish I'd known that some treatments and strategies that worked pre-amputation simply aren't a good idea post-amputation. So as a general rule, before doing what used to work for you, maybe take a few minutes to reflect on whether it's still a valid idea, given your change in circumstances. And of course, talk to your doctor. Number nine, before amputation, I assumed I'd be walking around as much as I used to once I had a prosthetic leg. Now that I'm more experienced, I know that a prosthesis is only one of several mobility aids in my metaphorical tool belt. Even when I have a prosthesis, I still use a wheelchair a lot for a variety of reasons. If I'm going to be sitting at the computer all day, it feels pointless to put on a leg. It's just not that comfortable. Or maybe my skin needs a break from the liner, or I have an injury, or it's the middle of the night and after going splat, I realize that my wheelchair is a better way to get to the bathroom. A prosthesis isn't going to magically make your life exactly the way it used to be in your two-legged days. It's one of many tools, and different tools are suitable for different circumstances. So do yourself a favor and make peace with the fact that you'll still need things like a wheelchair, crutches, and knee scooters. Real quick, what's something you wish you'd known before amputation? Tell me in the comments, and while you're down there, click the like button and the little bell. I mean, I did a faceplant for your entertainment. Multiple faceplants, actually. Oh. <sighs> this isn't very fun to do repeatedly. I did it for you. And all I ask in return is a click of a button. Not a bad trade, I'd say. Anyway, before amputation, I really wanted a definite timeline on what to expect for phantom limb pain. 
Phantom pain is variable. Some amputees have it, others don't. And the severity can vary. That said, the members of my medical team seem to concur that phantom pain usually starts about a week post-amputation, gets very intense, then around the seven or eight week mark, things start to improve. This proved true for me. I reached my baseline about half a year post-op. If you'd like more details about phantom limb pain, I bet you can find it online. Or maybe in that playlist right there. And if you're facing amputation, I'm sorry you're going through such a drastic life change. Just know that there's still life on the other side of amputation. Better days will come, and you can get through this. I'm Stephanina, and I'll see you next time.